We just got started on Facebook. Now we are started here on our uh, Zoom webinar. And uh, it's so exciting to see everybody jumping in. There's already new familiar names from seeing you here on the webinars because this is our third one. So the online writing workshop has been open now since Monday. All three parts of the workshop training are available for you. And this is our third and our final of these writing clinics, these live writing clinics. Um, but we've got a lot more to come. So don't worry, I'll be telling you more about what's coming up next week. Um, really exciting announcement next week. We do have one more live session that's gonna be a little different than this, um, but just as beneficial. So I really encourage you to, to hop in for that one. Um, and to mark your calendar to go in and watch the recording. But thank you for being here. So I want to also introduce York. York is here with me, and she is our our um, our host for this session. She's going through your questions. And uh, thanks for being here, York. Thanks for having me, Kelly. Absolutely. So I always like to start these with a question. And the question that I have for you today is when you think of courses, what is one word that comes to mind for you? It might be something like power or intuition, beauty, freedom. I'm really curious to hear just if you had to pick one word that just when you think horses, what kind of a feeling or what kind of, um, what kind of emotion comes for you? So I'm curious, York, what would your word be? Oh gosh, um, probably joy. I think I always try to have this sense of joy in my center when I'm around horses and they reflect that back. I love that, I love that. Some I'm of these others sure. are really great. There's like magic, love, freedom, relaxation, beauty, therapist, I love that one. <laughs> yeah. Peace. That's actually that's actually one that I was thinking of. It would be hard for me to to pick one as well, but peace because I feel like even our you know sometimes we have horses that are very anxious, they're nervous. Uh, I think a lot of that is caused by the way that we keep them, and sometimes have to keep them in domestic situations. But the more time that I've spent with the mustangs and with wild horses, there truly is this sense of of peace that is. Um, I love that part. I love being with a group of horses that are, you know, on a field and they're grazing and, and wandering around and just, just being there with them, there can be such a feeling of stillness and quietness and kind of harmony with being there in the moment. I love that. I love harmony. Yeah. All right. Well, keep putting in your, your words as you're jumping in here and joining. Um, it's a Saturday, so I hope that a lot of you are, um, this was an easier time for you to come and join us. I want to, I'll give you a quick agenda for the call. So if you've joined in on any of our other live calls, this is gonna be a similar kind of format. And um, I'm gonna get started with a little exercise for you to kind of follow along with. And then we're gonna go through three riding videos. Be back on that. Um, it, the riders today have some different, different things that they are working on. We have um, some, more experienced riders. We have a rider that's working on uh, jump position that I'm gonna give some feedback on. And then we're gonna go through as many of your questions as we can within our hour here together. And at the end, I'll just give you the, the, the heads up for what's coming up next here in our workshop and our time together. So a little bit of housekeeping is uh, when you enter your comments, and I should have mentioned this even before you started putting your words in, but make sure that in that chat, that you mark your comment to go to everyone instead of just to presenters or panelists. That way everyone can see it. And also as we start to get rolling here and you have some questions, whether it is a general question, whether it is a specific question on the feedback that I'm giving for the video, put it in the Q&A. That makes York's life a lot easier here in this call so that she can keep track of your questions and uh, we'll get through as many as we can uh, what I've been doing is popping into the Facebook group as well, for those of you that are part of our, our Writers Workshop Facebook group, and uh, just answering a few in there because we've had so many great questions come in. But one of the ways that I strive to teach is, is principle-based, 
And that goes for not only what we're doing here in the workshop and what I presented in the different trainings, but also as we go forward into the full balance riding course, because my, my objective, what I strive to do is to teach you the principles that you can use no matter what level of riding you are, you know, that will stay, stay true for you no matter what level you're at, regardless of the discipline that you're doing. And, and even regardless of the training method. And it actually is, I find very empowering to understand the principles behind what we're doing because it allows us to evaluate any method. And think about this as really being like your foundational training. We're going back to the foundation that allows us to really go so much further. And it doesn't matter if you've just started riding or if you're a really experienced rider, the more that we can re revisit the foundation, the more that we can really understand, hey, here is the, here's the science behind techniques. Here's why things work, as well as, of course, I love to give you specific exercises and spe specific techniques to help, but it's these two things together. It's like the theory, the principles, and then also the, the what to go out and do. When we can have those together, I think that gives us the best toolbox to be successful in our riding, in training our horse, in solving, um, you know, challenges, behavior problems that come up, or in solving our own challenges in the school. And uh, we've, um, I've had some really good discussions with students as well throughout this last week in the workshop of remembering how individual instruction is, um, or I shouldn't, it, instruction can be very individual, but it's more that what we what our best path forward is for each person, for each rider can be unique. So we can kind of walk down the same thing. We can go through this training together, but the pieces that are gonna be most important for each person um, it might vary. And also embracing that, that you know, we're not trying to fit into a box of everyone's gonna be in the exact same, your hands go at this place and your leg goes here and you sit in the saddle this way because that just doesn't make sense. Just like with horses, we have to adjust. It's not going to be as, as um, set in stone as, you know, do this exercise for three days and now do this exercise for three days. Because what I want to give you here is the ability to go beyond that and to really have confidence in finding that, that best path for you and your horse. And I would love to help be a guide in that. We're going to talk more about that next week, the opportunities there. Um, but for now, again, thank you for being here. Great comments. And let's dive into today's call. So it, I asked um, at the beginning, you know, the question was to think about when you think of the horse, what is one word that comes to mind? And now I would love you to just take a moment. Um, it, I said, you know, you might want to, you might want to um, bring a piece of paper and a pen to some of these sessions to take some notes. And what I would encourage you to think about next is what gives you the most joy in your riding and with horses? So joy was, was York's word that came with being around horses. And I love this one too. And it's something that we're gonna be talking about more in the coming week of connecting to why do you ride? But I want you to just take a moment and, and think of what is the time that gives you the most joy? And go ahead and just put that in the comments. Uh, working together from Tina, trust in the teamwork, connection, synchronization. Awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of this. Um, Speaking the same language from Brandy. I love how you said that flow. Amazing, trust. <laughs> Great comments, but again, I love these. And I, this is what I love about our community. And honestly, this is why I feel we are here together. We're here, we're, why we are here at horse class and why you've joined us in this workshop is what we have in common is this feeling of wanting to be connected to the horse, that the feeling of relationship and connection is more important than just bringing a blue ribbon home or just being able to go out for a gallop. Not that those things can't be super fun and a really rewarding part of our experience riding as well, but it's the connection that's the most important piece. And that goes across 
um, anything that we do and any kind of writing that we do. So I would just encourage you to kind of take a moment, let that sink in as you, as I asked that question and you thought about it, and just think how many times do I allow myself to really feel that in my riding and with my horse? There's times that we can get we can get over focused on what I need to do, what I need to teach my horse to do, how I need to ride. And we might actually start to pull ourselves away from those moments that do give us the most joy. So just think of that, whatever that, whatever came to mind for you when I asked that question. I would also encourage you to wonder, you know, how, how much do I, do I allow myself those moments and could I create more of those? Okay, so on that note, let's go ahead and jump into the videos. So as I get the video, our first video pulled up here, I want to just um, kind of preface by uh, by letting you know that my connection is a little off today and um, I might not be able to unfortunately have the videos play as smoothly as we would prefer. But what I'll do is we'll watch them play a little bit and then we'll, I'll use the, uh, you know, I'll just pause the video so we have a, like a single screen so it's not too choppy for everyone. And then we'll be able to, uh, to look at it look at it in moments through pausing. Okay, so this video was sent in by Mindy and um, I'm just gonna go back to Mindy's submission form here. So Mindy, and this is her horse Bodie. Mindy said, I have trouble keeping um, Bodie's pace steady and the transitions can be rough. So Bodie's a 13 year old gelding. They have um, been together for four months. And before me, he was trail ridden Western and only once every few months. So a part of the question with Bodhi is also this fitness. So transitions, looking at fitness. So I'm gonna go ahead and play the video and then just let me know how smooth or, or, or not so smooth it is. And maybe York, you can let me know how it looks for you. Yeah, it's a bit laggy, Kelly. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause here. And first we'll just talk a little bit about, um, you know, this is our third call together. So I'm gonna, we're, we're slightly going into some things that are a bit more advanced. Um, so you can kind of see the progression. And that's why I wanted to bring this one in. So when we are starting to, when we're working on fitness for horses and fitness is a really important part because anytime we think of our riding, of course, it's never just about how we're sitting in the saddle because having a successful ride, feeling good, is our horse needs to be physically prepared for what we're asking them to do. And that physical preparation is fitness, not just in terms of cardio, you know, can they, can they trot around for 15 minutes, but it's also in terms of using their body that they're well balanced with the rider. And that comes in in phases. And one of the first things is just getting forward movement and getting rhythm in movement. And even though I know it's a little choppy, so for you guys, it probably does not look very rhythmic at all. The good, the good start that Mindy and Bodhi have here is that there's a rhythm to the movement. However, thinking of transitions, in order to improve these transitions, what Bodhi's going to um, need to be able to start doing is stretching more forward with his neck and lengthening his top line. So you've probably heard that, you know, when horses move well, they need to lift their back or you need to get your horse's head down and get his back up. And that can seem like kind of just vague, like how do I tell if my horse's back is up? So we went through a, a version of this exercise in our, um, our first, first or second video together, but we're gonna go through it again here. So we can, we can do some movements with our, within our own body to help to understand these concepts. So your withers would be between your shoulder blades. So go ahead and just put your hand there at your withers and kind of feel your, feel your withers, <laughs> thoracic spine. And now I want you to take your, your hand and just put your fingers kind of right where the base of your skull meets your neck. Kind of a little indent there. 
And we can't actually feel, you know, exactly where that joint is of where that cervical vertebra connects to our skull, but you can just kind of feel that, that idea right there. So this would be like our pole. So what I want you to do is now think if you could just lift your pole kind of forward and up and notice what you feel along your whole back as you do that, starting with along your neck, down between your shoulder blades, so your upper back, your lower back. Doesn't matter if you're sitting or standing as you do this, but go ahead and just put in the chat, what is something that you felt as you made that movement? Did you feel maybe a little bit lighter? Did it feel, you know, you might hit a, might normal sometimes when we make different movements, we might hit a sticky spot of, oh, that felt a little weird, or there's a little place that I haven't stretched in a while. But what did you notice as you were doing that? And York, since I've got the video up, I'll let you read some of these comments. You see, release under my neck. That's a good one. Back lengthened, stretching out through upper back, arching, feel taller, felt my body align feel spine stretching, a kind of pulling up between my shoulder blades, um, back muscles stretched, jaw tightened. That's an interesting one. I think it's, it's always surprising how things are connected and when you make a change, feeling somewhere a bit unexpected. Yeah. Straighten and correct my back. Stomach contracted, that's a good one kind of an opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. So that's I actually want to um, want to kind of go a little further on that one, because this is one of those ideas we've been talking as well throughout looking at these videos of the idea of when do we need to have a strong core and how strong core is often um, misunderstood as like sucking your belly button, you know, make your your abs tight like you were doing a crunch and suck in your belly button. But this um, uh, sorry, I don't have your name in front of you, but who made the comment of that you felt your stomach change. When we do this, it's making a change that we don't have to make our abs tight. That's kind of a, a counter movement to try to do a crunch like movement and do a pelvic tilt or anything like that as we're as we're lengthening here. But as you just lengthened a little from the top of your neck, from the base of your skull, it changed and it actually started to um, engage more of your stabilizing system. And you probably weren't pulling your shoulders back or sticking your chest out or doing any of these kind of movements, other movements that were taught with riding, but just with a small movement, it changed the way that your posture was. Okay, so we did that movement because this is actually similar to what we want our horse to do. We want them to reach forward and down with their pole, and that lengthens that the whole top line of muscle but then that also will help to engage on the horse the thoracic sling, which is what engages to help lift the back. And it's, um, it's this whole connection of the system that gives us good movement from the horse. And we can start that even if you are a very beginner rider and you're just working on keeping your balance on a moving horse, you can still start to get the idea of this doing um, work in hand and we do some very basic in hand exercises and we look at horses moving to start to train your eye for this um, within the balanced riding course. We have other programs here at Horse Class that go like a much deeper study into all of these different areas, but the balanced riding course gets you started in each of these and gives you exercises to again give you this like big picture foundation. Okay, so coming back here to Mindy and Bodhi for this, this is going to be the next step for Bodhi is he's got a rhythm, he's got a pretty free, uh, free movement here. Um, it, Mindy has a freedom through her movement as well. You know, there's little tweaks that we could do, but, but the, um, the two of you together make a nice, a nice pair going around. The one thing that would help Mindy, and this is, you know, again, you've probably heard me mention this in the other videos, is just bringing your leg back a little bit more. So when we look at, I'll, I'll pause it again here soon, um, when we look at your lower leg, not that you're bracing forward and really pushing into your heel and pushing forward on the stirrup, but there's moments, especially when you go into that rising phase of your trot, that it's kind of swinging forward and then it comes back. 
And if instead in that rise phase, instead of going more into your feet, excuse me, if you went more onto your thigh, that's gonna help keep your lower leg underneath of you. And it's just a, it's just a little tweak for you. Um, but what I wanna focus on for the transition is going to be Bodhi's movement. So he's got this rhythm, but what's gonna help him is starting to do um, more exercises that help him have this idea, this feeling we just did of reaching forward and lengthening his top line. I would start with doing a bit of this on the ground to give him the idea, doing some little in-hand exercises. Then when you're riding, doing more circles, um, doing work over poles, over cavaletti. And we can get, um, here's the thing when we're training movement. The way that a experienced rider can get on and can help to shape a horse into movement because they have the feeling of where the horse needs to be and they can often do that pretty quickly. Sometimes, as we talked about in the last call, skilled riders have to be careful because a really skilled rider can actually get more out of a horse than they might be physically ready for. But a skilled rider can also really help support the horse in this is where you need to be. However, even if we're not yet at that level of of really knowing, uh, I'm not quite sure what it actually feels like when my horse is, say, lengthening its top line, we can use exercises like ground poles and like doing, um, you know, creating a circle and having that moment where we, we open a little with the inside rein and the horse stretches and we start to get that feeling on the circle. Um, also putting poles on a circle can be really helpful. So I would start with that, with first getting a little bit more of the reaching forward in the movement and then also for transitions, improving transitions, I'm going to just skip ahead here. See if I remember where in the video it was. So when you're, whenever you're having trouble with transitions, do two things. The first is to think about the rhythm of the gate that you're going in and out of. So meaning if you're going up into canter, as you want to have that transition, think about a rhythm of one, two, three, one, two, three, to help with that transition up. When you're ready to come back down to trot, then think of that rhythm of trot in your mind. One, two, one, two, one, two. So your body starts to be in the rhythm of the next gait. And it's amazing how the horse can feel those subtle changes that we don't have to do such big things like pull on the reins or suddenly sit down in the saddle or do things that kind of affect our horse's balance. And then sure, they might go into canter or they might stop, but it's gonna be a lot more harsh. It's not gonna just have that smooth, fluid flow through the transition. So keeping the rhythm in the transition and then also doing um, transitions in and out. So here, this was actually a lovelier transition down because he reached, Bodhi reached a little bit with his neck as he came down in this transition. And then what I would have done there, because he had kind of a nice transition to walk, and then the energy just kind of stuck back out of the walk, is to go back into trot. So another thing when there's a, um, when we need help with transitions, is doing lots of work where we're going back and forth. So trot to walk, back into trot, walk, back into trot, so that it keeps the horse with more energy and it more impulsion as they're thinking about, I'm gonna push into the next gate or I'm gonna slow down and I'm gonna to have to push again. And that can be really helpful. Okay, any questions on this discussion we had here for Mindy and Bodhi? So Joanne asked, should we do this ourselves when riding as in lifting the withers? And I love this question because my dressage instructor always says to like hold an orange between your shoulder blades. Yes, this is um, this is definitely one that, that you can that you can do as you're riding. And again, it's such a small thing because with any movement, we we put too much effort into it. We can go beyond what it is. We can go beyond the benefit of it. So if you're riding around and you're thinking about doing this and stretching up, now I've just lifted my chest, I've, I've hollowed a little bit in my back, and I've lost the benefit. But instead, if I just think about that slight lift, just where I feel it expanding, and I'm not using muscular tension anywhere, but I'm just using that little lift, that can make a, a huge difference. So um, what, uh, whenever I watch Wendy Murdoch teach, and Wendy is another one of her instructors here at horse class, she will introduce a concept, and then she'll tell the rider, now do half of that. 
Now do half of that. And sometimes she'll even go further. Now do half of that. So it's getting down to like an eighth of the original effort that the person put into that movement. And it, you will find that with the exercises that I introduced throughout this workshop too, for example, in bringing your lower leg back is if you strain it to your absolute, you know, you put all your muscle into, you make your butt really tight, you try to push your leg back, that's going to counteract the benefit of the exercise. So you get the movement, normal to use a little more effort the first few times, and then you think about how can I get this with less effort, less effort, and that's that idea as well as we pair away the excess movement as we learn. All right, let's do one more question here before we go into the next one. All right, Yvonne asks, when do you want to lengthen the horse's neck versus when you want the connected rein contact where there is bend in the neck? Ah, this is a great question. So we actually always want to lengthen the neck. So we always want the horse lengthening the neck, even in the most uphill frame. So if you watch a, a true uh, classical rider, you know, that's working even in the high school um, and working with a lot of collection, the horse is still lengthening. It's just that as the degree of collection increases, the horse squats more. So the horse's frame is always lengthening, but they start to squat more, which puts more weight on the hind end, gives more power to the hind legs, and brings the horse into more of this collected higher frame. So probably what you're thinking of is like, when do we want to have this long neck in terms of like loose rein, really long neck, the, the throat latch is, you know, really open, the nose is out. Um, even in that, so I teach that first on a long rein, then I'll start to take contact there, but it's shaping that the horse is actually reaching into the bit, into that contact. Um, that's really important because if we just take contact and now we're trying to pull the neck in, in order to get this look of my horses on the bit because his neck is arched, um, it, that is that long term is actually quite um, detrimental to the horse. It puts a lot of physical strain on their body because what happens, we went through this exercise on um, workshop with the live one or two, I forget now, but we lengthened here. Now do the opposite. Now shorten. The thing, if you were to shorten your neck, what you have to do to do that, you kind of have to pull your chin in. You've got to push your, your head down, not super comfortable. And that actually is the feeling that we're creating in the horses if we try to pull their head in and then push them forward. So it, um, going into a higher level frame is a process of keeping the neck length in as we teach the horse to, um, to uh, fit, you know, to squat a little bit more. Uh, and another one of our horse class instructors who teaches our show jumping courses, Angelo Teletine, he teaches the exact same thing for the show jumpers. He does a lot of bridalist show jumping. He competes bridalists up to three, six, three, nine. Um, actually, I think he might've even done some now four foot level bridalists, but you watch his horse go around the course and his horse has a pretty low neck. And even between the jumps, you know, the horse is reaching down with his neck. He comes into the base of a jump. The neck stays really long and kind of telescoped out towards the jump, but the horse squats the last few strides and then has a beautiful jump. So there's so much that we do riding that our, our horses perform in spite of what we're doing, not because of what we're doing. And um, us silly riders think that we're actually helping our horse when many times I think we're more getting in their way. Okay, great questions. I'm gonna go to uh, our next video here. So this next video is Sharon. And uh, this is gonna go right with the topics that we have been talking about because Sharon also wanted to work on um, steadiness with her horse. She's got a lovely horse here. So steadiness in gait and also um, steadiness in, in head carriage. All right, so again, unfortunately, I think most of our videos today are not gonna play the most smooth. So I'll play a little bit here for you. If it looks choppy, you're probably we're probably all having the same problem, and then I'll just pause it at a good point that we can that we can discuss a little bit more.
Okay, so Sharon and her horse here are, are really a lovely pair. Sharon's obviously a skilled rider. Um, it, I'm totally making a, a guess and a judgment from their equipment and their tack, but my guess would be that this pair is, um, is an eventing pair. Gonna play a little bit more here, just even if it's choppy, so you guys can get a little bit of the feel of the of this horse and rider. So this is a lovely horse, looks really athletic. Sharon looks very, very solid in her tack. She's able to be a very um, you know, still rider in terms of we're not seeing a lot of excess movement just because. I guess would be the, the experience level and her time riding. So this is one of the things as we, well, at, at any level, actually sometimes tweaks can be very small for improvement, but there's a few things here that I think are really gonna help um, Sharon and her horse. So the first is this is going to go, I'm just going to pause it here. This is going to go along with um, what we were talking about in that, the last little section, this idea of movement. And this is kind of the theme of, of our videos today, this idea. So this horse as well, I think, would benefit from um, going around with just a little bit more forward with the neck. So a little bit more forward and even allowing that forward to come through the body, not going faster, but just that we start to see even a bit more um, kind of swing through the back um, and that, that, that look of swinging. And what I really like, I don't know if I can find the exact moment here, but where these two are off to a good start is uh, there was some point here, this is a longer video, ah, right in here. So as um, Sharon comes around this corner and she's riding on a, a shorter rein here, and I want you to see how as soon as she lengthens her rein, how her horse is reaching down into that rein. And that's the idea we want to have, that the horse is seeking the contact of the bit and is reaching down. So that tells me that, Sharon, you'll probably have a pretty easy job of allowing, um, riding your horse with just a little bit longer rein and seeing how that feels with just a little longer rein, not necessarily because your horse is ready to work, he looks fit, He's ready to work at a little higher level, but not um, see if you can have that higher level and build more of that squat while keeping the neck lengthening. So for that, I would work more on um, doing some lateral movements. So do some lateral movements and then do some 20 meter circles and then go back to some lateral movements and then some 20 meter circles. And especially when you go out on those circles, allow for a longer neck, keeping the same rhythm but just with a longer frame. Okay, so here's the other thing also that's really going to help Sharon is that idea that we talked about of um, lengthening a little bit here from the top of the neck, but also opening up the upper body. So sometimes when we start riding, and this can be, if we're thinking a lot about keeping a horse in a frame, this can also happen if we are riding a horse that's feeling like they're really forward and like, you know, if we let go of the reins, they're gonna be taken off. Um, is we could start to get really forward through our shoulders. And um, when we're hanging onto the reins, it turns into just this like using all your might to hang on. And this can again happen with really forward horses, or if we're really thinking about, I've got to hold this horse together to keep them in frame. So what I would recommend here, Sharon, is think about, we went through this in the first video, coming just a little forward with your sternum. So opening your chest and anytime that your horse starts to feel like they get heavy, first, before you go to respond with the reins, think, can I come forward with my sternum? Can I open my chest? And that is gonna really help with the bringing the balance of the horse more, a little bit lighter, allowing a little bit more of that squat and then freeing up the front end for a longer neck and smoother movement. Um, so we can see a little bit of it here. I'm just gonna go back and I'm gonna, pause the frame. So right in here, instead of taking the stronger contact right away, just think about coming forward with the sternum. And as you come forward with your sternum, 
just that movement will allow you to sit back a little bit more instead of coming forward. So there's all these different ways that we can get to the position that we need. So for example, if I have a rider that tends to be more forward, and any of you that are listening, if you've ever been told, sit up, you're, you know, you're, you're rolling forward. If we just sit up and we hinge our back and we pull our shoulders, we're not very stable there anymore. But if we think about from this position, opening our chest by coming forward with our sternum and using this idea of lengthening our neck and our back, now we're open, but we open by coming into alignment instead of through tension. Okay, so I will stop here because we still have a lot to go through. Any questions on this horse and rider and the discussion we just had? All right. Allison asks, how do we encourage our horse to stretch out and down? And on this question, someone else asks about their horse stretching overly far down to the ground. Okay, great questions. Um, I, I usually, the best way to start, so you can teach, you can teach the horse reaching a few different ways. I do love to teach it on the ground. I love in hand work. I think it is super beneficial because when we give the idea of a movement, then it makes it easier to access that movement they later under saddle. So I love teaching this, this idea of releasing through the top line and stretching forward and getting that first on the ground. Then from the saddle, we can start to teach it by taking a rein pressure. And when the horse reaches, we release the rein pressure. However, and this is where it comes into, we can understand the principles and then we can say, ah, but this is the technique that I need right now. Working over ground poles are excellent for creating this movement from the horse and allowing you as the rider to start to feel the movement as you're working on your own position. So I would start without you know, necessarily knowing what your riding level is. Um, I think it was Allison. I would start with, um, with working over ground poles. And as you go over the ground poles, notice the change in your horse as they're going over the poles and reaching forward. See if they perhaps start to be able to keep that position a little bit longer and then work from there. And we always start to, it, it's kind of like a little checklist, you know, because we always got to start with, does our, is our horse physically comfortable and does our equipment fit? Is our saddle comfortable for the horse? If they're not comfortable. They can't stretch their back because if something's pinching and they stretch their back and it is uncomfortable, they're going to stay tense. They have to stay tense to protect themselves. It's the same if we're riding in a position that we're braced against them, even if it's unconscious, we're not doing it purposely, but if we're braced against them, then they won't be able to reach forward and move well either. So we got to kind of check off, uh, does our tack fit well? Is the horse physically able to do this? Are we riding in a way that allows them to do this? And then we go into how do we train them and support them to do this? Okay, I think let's do one more question here and then we'll go to the next video. Excellent. So I have two people asking, um, oh, sorry, it's both Joanne. Um, can you explain why a horse seeks contact with the bit? Can the concept of a horse reaching into the bit apply if we ride riderless or bitless? Sorry, bitless. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely applies. Um, it, it is a horse reaching into the bit is a sign of good training. Um, when they're doing it in a way, I mean, snatching and rooting into the bit is, is different. But when a horse is reaching into the bit, it's a sign of good training that one, they've learned to trust that contact. Because if they, if, if they have been ridden heavy handed or unsteady hands or jerking around, they're not going to trust reaching into it. They're going to keep their neck tight and their head back and try their head up in order to try to brace against any contact that's coming there. They're also going to keep their jaw tight in order to protect against you know, the jaw being pulled down. So it, when a horse is reaching, it really comes from, from good training of when there was pressure on that bit, they learn to be able to relax into that pressure. And the same goes with if you're riding with a bitless bridle. And um, there's many different styles of bitless bridles. So you've got to look at the style that you're using and look at where is it putting pressure on the horse. Um, for example, typically my favorite style is the side pull because it's a very simple, it just, you know, you've got the pressure across the bridge of the nose. So it's the same concept there that you're putting pressure there. And then you're looking for that feeling of, um, 
it's relaxation. It can be an, a very active relaxation. You know, you can have relaxation cantering along where the horse lengthens their neck, opens a little bit here, softens in the jaw, and that's really the moment then we release. And this is where riding is that, that dance of um, pressure and release, pressure and release. These things absolutely can be trained through positive reinforcement. But to me, there's always a level of, um, of pressure and release there, even just within our body of, you know, when we just tense a little, when we're expecting something and then the horse gives and we soften to that. And it's just kind of this, this back and forth. The other thing to be super aware of is that when we, okay, we as humans, I think this is actually true. They've, they've shown, um, uh, what is it called? It's like an opposition response. I don't think that's the right word for it, but it's pretty much true for, for mammals that when there's an energy pushing, get, pushing against, when there's brace against, we're going to brace back. So think of it, um, you know, I, I do this exercise with people feeling the difference. But you can even think of it like a dog on a leash. If the dog starts to pull into the leash and then you pull back on the dog, they usually pull harder into the leash. And now you're both just pulling on each other. Like with our horses too. If our horse gets tight and starts to pull into the bridle and now we get tight and we're pulling on the reins, and now they're tight and we're both braced against each other. So as riders, part of our practice is learning that we can, um, we can keep pressure, but without bracing. So we can keep pressure there, but we don't have to go into this, all right, now I'm gonna start pulling, that we just keep pressure there and we soften. And that softening can often really change the um, response that we're getting from the horse. So I know that was kind of a long, maybe not as super direct, but I think understanding that bigger picture is important for, for that concept. Okay. Let's go into our final video because I want to make sure we go through all three here and then we'll take more questions. Okay, so this is the Oban and um, I apologize if my pronunci pronunciation of um, of your name is not correct here. But I wanted to bring in this video um, because Dioban is working on um, a jump position here. We haven't really gotten to discuss jump position, but also the, the exercise that I'm gonna give here is gonna be right along the same idea that we've been actually talking about all the way through our, our live call today. So I'll play again. This is a short one, so I can play it through and then we'll easily find a, a place to pause. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce two ideas here. I'll just pause it right here. Um, it, the first idea is also going along with this, how do, we, how do we carry our bodies and how do we move? And I mentioned with um, the last video, with Sharon's video, this idea of, um, coming forward through the sternum of expanding the rib cage. We talked about this. So, you know, we've got this feeling kind of expanding and expanding through the upper body, but, you know, without using tension to try to push your chest out, do those kind of movements. We can think of the same thing here. And this goes with what I was also just saying about, we tend to pull on the reins and then we get braced. <clears throat> and it's easy to feel this in jump position and then train this feeling for when you're, when you're riding in any other posture as well. So what I recommend here when you're training jump position is to learn to push into the neck. So what I would recommend um, it, for this rider, shorten your reins a little bit, press your knuckles into the neck. And I want you to do that with me here. So imagine that you were riding and that you were pressing into something. Just like imagine your horse's neck in front of you. And what happened to your body as you did that? Did it come forward? Did it go back? Remember you're pushing into it. So you're not leaning forward. We wanna maintain our balance in any posture that if the horse disappeared out from underneath of us, think that you would land springy on your feet. So if we start to lean forward and lean on the horse's neck as a kind of um, 
balance point, if the horse was to disappear, or more realistic, realistically, if they were to just put their head down, you can topple over. Or if you come into a jump and they trip coming into the jump, or they have a quick stop at the jump, we know what happens next. But instead, think about pushing to the neck and push back. So I would just love to put in the comments, as you're doing this, this little visualization, what are you feeling through your body? And as we start to get some responses in, York, I'll let you read them off so I can keep the video pulled up. All right, so an equestrian says that I tensed up. Ruth said that it went into her legs, so weight further over legs. Cleve said back lengthened, come tightened. Wynn said arms tightened. Allison said stability. Interesting. So I, These are all, I, yeah, really good. Yes, and I love this, and I love the contrast between the two. So this is such a good example of um, why we have to really look for the meaning behind the instruction and why we have to experiment with our own body to find, oh, there's the feeling. So the, uh, the, um, those folks that mentioned about like back lengthening, weight came more to the legs, those ideas, I would encourage those of you that found tension or found tightness to think about if you can do this with less effort. And think about this idea of pushing off of the neck, but with that like, half to a quarter of the effort that you use so that you're pushing yourself back and um and also notice if you can as you push back create more space between your hands and your upper body so as you're pushing on your imaginary horse deck think of a little bit more space coming in here so kind of keep doing that i'm gonna i'm gonna play this again and talk about here in movement why it's so important so I want you to notice here, as Dioban's hands are kind of coming back and her chest is coming forward, it's, and it, she's pushing a little off her feet here, so it's creating this look of being just a little wobbly. Like if something happened, if the horse tripped or something happened, she'd probably get it at the minimum jostled around. And then coming in here, we can see her body kind of tips forward a little bit, and then she rocks back to come and do the downward transition. So here, what I'm gonna recommend for you is push into the neck when you're in this two point and just let your body come back a little. And it's not about sitting up, but instead it's about creating a little more space and it's creating this idea of keeping openness. This is the same reason that when we're riding, we want to shorten our reins to keep this openness through our upper body through the joints of our elbow, for example, instead of just pulling our hands back and like pulling our hands back towards our belly or into our hips. And why this is, why I wanted to show it here is this is true not just for jump position. So what I'm saying explicitly here of push into the neck and jump position is the exercise for here. The principle is that we wanna maintain the space through the upper body, we want to keep the angle of the elbow open, which means shorten your reins instead of always bringing your hands back. So do you see there how there's the principle that under like the principle of movement and alignment that that goes with the specific technique here for when you're in in um, a two point or jump position of push on the neck to understand that feeling. So here's the interesting thing too. One of the exercises that we do in the balance riding course is when I'm teaching downward transitions, I will teach this idea of actually push a little forward with your hands. So instead of pulling your hands back and pulling back on the reins, you expand your body. So it's this idea of like, if you were pushing forward and there's an exercise that helps to feel that, that will help you get your downward transitions much more smoothly and allowing the horse to lengthen through the, through the top line than just pulling on the reins. So this is all kind of, we started this call with the um, first horse and rider reaching forward, lengthening along their top line, talking about the importance of that. We did the little exercise here, and then we moved into um, thinking about opening up here. And now I'm introducing this idea of 
think about expanding the space and actually expanding that where your body's coming slightly back, your hands coming slightly, slightly forward. It's that idea of expansion that's going to help in all of the movement to allow the horse to maintain the frame that we talked about in the beginning. So we kind of went through a lot. I know today was more advanced on purpose of um, the videos that we looked about and kind of some of the discussion that we went into. So it is totally fine with any learning to take something like this and say, I don't quite get it yet. <laughs> and to keep working on the, you know, the, um, the very basics of find that alignment, keep your leg under, under you, work on breathing, let the top of your pelvis come back. Focus on all of that. That's all you need to is those first little bits, but you have the bigger picture and you know where you can start to go with it. Um, it there's a lot more that I could talk about just in terms of uh, jump position and everything else, but for now, let's go to go back to questions and first any questions on what we talked about here. So Morgan shares that she has a horse who's a big mover during all of his gates. She says, I'm getting used to how big his movements are. And I was wondering if you had any advice regarding how to really develop a strong seat in the saddle, be smooth with the horse that's a big mover. How do I stay connected with him through the transitions? Yeah, this is, uh, I know exactly what you're feeling, Morgan, because some of the big, big moving horses can feel like just in a transition from walk to trot, they're, you know, throwing you up to the moon. Um, so what I would recommend, you know, without, without seeing you specifically and being able to kind of tell you, you know, where something might be in your own body. And this is what I love about when we include the video coaching, because then I can make advice a lot more personal. But generally what I would recommend is actually to, um, to do two things. So one is to do quite a few exercises where you're actually riding with one hand. So reins in one hand, the other hand on the back of the saddle, um, like what I demoed in, um, in uh, video three of our workshop training. You can also do hand out to the side. Um, you can do hand on the top of your head. But the reason that I'm recommending these different positions is when we get unsteady as primates, we tend to grip with our hands. It's a very instinctual thing to do. It's how we steady ourselves. We want to grab something and get it, catch our equilibrium. When we're riding with reins, that ends up being the reins. And that's where sometimes we end up kind of wanting to hang on the reins or we even just have to kind of grab and catch our balance by tightening our hand, tightening our upper body. So where you can train your body to catch your balance through um, your adjustment through center, through centering yourself, through your, your hips, making those movements in. And also what that does is, is teach you to catch your balance by lowering your center of gravity, by lowering your weight. That's gonna really help with just you feeling more balanced and with your horse's movement. And then I would also recommend, um, like you can go, you can also work over poles doing these different positions. And then you could start to think too about, you know, your horse is a really big mover. Is he, is he moving really big with good movement or is he moving really big with like he springs into the trot and um, you know, head goes up and everything goes up. If he's really working and working through his back, um, the movement's still gonna be big. In fact, in a way, sometimes it can almost feel bigger, but it's gonna have a lot more rhythm and cadence to it. I hope that's helpful. All right, and then Shelly asks, how do I apply all this to Western riding? It is exactly the same, Shelly. It truly is. It truly is. There's, um, I mean, I'm trying to think of, you know, the, the difference in our disciplines is in the ultimate activity, you know, that we have the horse doing. Um, but I think of it this way. If you were watch a horse working cattle, um, a really good horse that's working cattle, and I have um, have some amazing friends that are are judges for um, reining and for cutting, and I've um, I've sat in on some of the clinics, and they're looking for very similar things, and they want to see a horse that's balanced, that looks free in his movement, free through his neck, and can go down to that cow. And if you watch when they, you know, when that horse squats to make a quick move to follow that cow. He squats and his neck needs to be free. 
if that rider is you know having to pull in the rein or having to keep the horse's neck tight to try to force those movements to happen not only is the horse going to be ineffective but he's not going to score very well so that's just one example of a western sport you know if we're riding if you're riding western and you're riding out on the trail it's the same kind of concept a horse that is using himself well is going to be more comfortable to ride he's going to have better gaits he's going to be calmer so when horses really use themselves well they've got rhythm they've got good movement they're actually less likely to spook than a horse that's, that that is tight and has more tension through their body um i feel like i could give so many examples because it, it really is true these principles it does not matter what the discipline is they're true because they're about good movement in the body and they're about good alignment for us you know when if we're riding a um a western horse we might have a longer stirrup um it, we might if that horse has a nice jog we might do a lot more have a lot more time sitting in the saddle instead of rising the trot if we're riding a jumper um we're going to be in a forward fold a lot more as we're going around the jump course or as we're out riding the cross country course we're going to have our stirrups a lot shorter if uh if we're riding um an endurance course we might be also with a longer stirrup we might be changing positions a lot more to you know kind of tire the muscles in in different ways so it's not too repetitive but those those principles they really do the stay the same and our students here we have um it, it ends up being rough, roughly 50 50 of our audience of english and western riders I happen to have more English tax because I love to jump um, and that's the activity that I love and that's what we have our at our riding school and it's a lot easier to it's a lot easier to have all the same type of saddle and just all the different variations um, but it's uh, I started riding western that was my start for for many years and so I decided I wanted to jump and uh, I yeah I, I really really stress that in the horse world and it's one of the things that i think can be so dividing is is people say i do this discipline or this discipline but man we're all riding and the basic basics are the same great question okay i think we've got time for one more excellent um akram says that it was hard to get a western saddle where he is so he's going to change riding from western to english i have no experience with the english saddle before hope you can give me some tips for more confidence with the English saddle. So the first thing that you'll that you'll probably feel is that there's a lot less leather around you. There's you know there's a lot um, there's a lot less behind you and in front of you. And this is where it does come into personal preference. Like I personally love my close contact saddles where there hardly is anything there. For one, it's what I'm accustomed to because I've just spent a lot of my riding in those kind of saddles, um, and I just like that feeling of being that not a lot of leather and being really close to the horse so that is what you're the first thing you're probably going to notice what i would recommend is um starting off with honestly the basics of kind of finding your alignment in the new saddle um it, do some exercises like we did through the workshop training here even like what i just described of you know kind of putting your hands different places if you were riding western you are probably accustomed to riding with one hand you can keep riding with one hand as you, you know, learn as your body gets used to the saddle, go to two hands as you, you know, learn how to um, use those different rain cues. And, uh, and, you know, keep in mind too, that the, a good fitting saddle for horse and rider is, is very important. And if you feel like you're really struggling in the English saddle, it take a look at it and how it fits you, because it might not just be that it's an English saddle, but that perhaps it doesn't fit that well. And that's one of the things that I've found. Um, I mean, this is just this is just one example, but for riders with really long thighs, and this can be true for for many men that have a longer thigh, they will find they have to be careful of they're aware of the saddle because if they've got a long thigh. The saddle can put their leg more out in front of them, which then it feels like it's harder to catch your balance. And that's where using an extra aid, like a stretchy equiband to keep the stirrup back, um, you know, really learning that you feel solid and where your alignment is, is important. And uh, I hope that helps. 
Okay, so we are right on the hour again. Thank you so much for all of the questions. I know there's so many good questions that have come in that I haven't been able to get through here, but we do have more time together. So the workshop is gonna be available um, through next week. Um, actually it's through, okay, I'm forgetting the exact date, but I think it's through October 28th. So you do still have time to go in and watch the workshop videos. I would encourage you to actually put the time and make sure you watch them because we will be taking them down. And once they're down, we don't put them back up. It's not very easy in our systems to just you know, have them back up to share. Once we take the links down, they're down. So make sure that you do get in and will you watch any part of the workshop that you've missed so far. What we have coming up next is next week, enrollment for the Balanced Writing course will be opening. Um, I am so excited to bring this to you. I'm actually, if you wait, just. Just one minute and grab something on the bookshelf behind me. So this is um, this is the new workbook that was created for the balance writing course. Um, it, this has, I mean, frankly, been several years in progress, but has been all of this year for the team. And what is really special and unique about this is. Uh, it's not just the workbook. We have a full course that goes with this, um, but I redesigned the workbook so that it's really easy to have as a quick reference when you're at the barn. And we put a QR code for um, each of the sections of the book that goes directly to the video that describes that. And uh, if you've enjoyed this workshop, if you felt like you've got value here, then I would love to have you. The course is, um, is lifetime access. So it's something that you can go through. It, it kind of grows with you. We have many alumni students that come back year after year and uh, do the program again. So there'll be more info on that. And it will be opening the morning of um, Tuesday, October 19th. And we're actually gonna have another live call that will start the call with uh, going over how you can take what you've been learning through this workshop and really apply it. So we'll, we'll talk about things like, you know, what if you have a writing instructor that is explaining things different? Um, what do you do when you go to try this and you think, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Um, we're gonna go over some of that, like how do you really apply what you've learned here to your work at home? And uh, I'll also give you all the details about the course and be able to answer any questions that you have. So thank you so much for being here. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. And I look forward to seeing you on our next live call, also seeing you in the comments through the workshop. Hi, everyone.